ask everybody to come on in, grab your coffee, take your seats. So as folks, uh, as folks come in and take their seats, I'd like to welcome everybody to day two of Capitol Hill Ocean Week 2015. I'd like to start uh, as, uh, for those of you who did not join us yesterday, with the new teaser for the uh, National Marine Sanctuary Foundation's campaign that will be rolling out over the summer and launched officially in the fall. If we could have the Go Deeper video, please, to give you all a sense of thinking about things a little bit differently, a little bit more deeply than we have in the past. So this morning we're going to take you on a tour of the United States and take you to two different coastal communities, one in the Great Lakes, one in uh, the Gulf, Florida Keys. And to start this morning's discussion, we're very delighted and honored to have two members of Congress with us, one from the House, one from the Senate, one from each, each destination. Uh, and, um, and to have both of them come with their uh, tight schedules is really terrific. Uh, and given their tight schedules, I'm going to be very quick on the formalities. Introduce Congressman Jolly, who's, uh, who's with us from, uh, from Florida. And, um, and the Congressman, um, Congressman's been uh, representing the 13th District since March 2014. And since arriving at the House, he has taken a leadership role in representing his district with legislation on uh, coastal flood insurance and, ra and managing rates for insurance, which is a real challenge for the industry, uh, championing beach renourishment projects to uh, address storm damage, dealing with vital pre-storm mitigation and habitat protection, looking at the hospitality, tourism, and recreation industries and how they affect his district. He's been a strong advocate for recreational and commercial fishing industries and um, looking for additional research funding to improve fish stocks, addressing the invasive lionfish problem that is uh, epidemic across the Gulf, and fighting for increased funding for water quality, oil spill recovery efforts, and generally looking to improve the uh, vitality of the Tampa Bay region and the Tampa Bay estuary, uh, his district. He's co-chair of the new Congressional Coastal Communities Caucus, and we're really delighted to have with us Congressman Jolly. Thank you, Congressman. Hey, thank you very much for that introduction. I've got nothing left to say now. That's perfect. Um, Folks, thank you very much, and I want to say thank you to Senator Baldwin for her, indul her indulgence of allowing me to go first. I'm the presiding officer at 10 a.m. in the House, and I said if I'm late, I think something happens in the Constitution if we're not actually gaveling in at 10. Uh, look, we are all here as advocates, uh, as champions of the ocean community, but also looking for greater champions on the Hill. And I want to share a cute story with you because I know it's kind of it's not too early in the morning, but in the morning I had this young man come into the office, about eight or nine years old, I'm sitting back in my office and I hear him say very confidently to our front office staff, he says, my name's Blake and I'm here for a tour of the Capitol. Congressman Jolly said he'd give me a tour and I want my tour. <laughs> and I could hear there was something a little different about this young man, the confidence, 
So I thought I might be able to pull one over on him. I walked out. I said, are you Blake? He said, I am. I said, I've been waiting for you, Blake. You're here for a tour of the Capitol. He said, I am. He said, this is my mom. This is my grandmother. I'm homeschooled in St. Petersburg. I'm here to learn what it's like to be a member of Congress. I said, well, if you want to learn what it's like to be a member of Congress before the tour, come sit behind my desk and you can really see what it's like. He said, can I do that? I said, sure, of course you can. So we walk in to my office and he turns around and says, wow, your room's as messy as mine is. <laughs> Why do I tell this story for a very important point? Members of Congress represent very diverse communities from their district to their state, priorities from oceans to immigration to national security to transportation. For Blake, all he expected of his member of Congress was a tour of the Capitol. He was eight or nine years old. But for others, we should expect more of our members of Congress, and we should expect them to understand the issues we face as a country and champion oceans and marine science and ocean research, champion clean water. Now, how do we do that? How do we make sure that the Hill advocates in the right way? You know, I had a, member, uh, a former director of NOAA say to me, we're looking for an oceans champion on the Hill. Well, folks, you've got one in Senator Baldwin and myself. We are ready to work with you. And how do we do that? First, and I say this as a Republican, we need elected officials to just plain and simple accept science. Accept the weather science. <laughs> accept weather science, accept climate science, and accept ocean science, right? We're members of Congress. Very few of us, I don't know if I could count them on one hand, actually have a scientific and research background to be able to talk intelligently about the science. Let's accept it, and then let's have an honest dialogue and debate about what the right federal role and federal response is to that science. That's a constructive conversation to have. So first, it goes with accepting the science. Second, we have to create more advocates, both on the Hill, in Congress, as well as in the community, in the research community, and across the country. Part of the reason we started the Coastal Communities Caucus is to do that, to create a forum in which we can talk about issues that are important, yes, to coastal communities, but ultimately to the marine environment and the ocean environment that washes ashore those coastal communities. And we have about 25 members. It is bipartisan, two Democrat chairs, two Republican chairs for, uh, from coast to coast. And I would ask you, for each of you who are speaking with members of Congress or staff, ask those members to join the Coastal Community Caucus so we can create an advocacy coalition to take on the issues we have to, to take on. What are those issues and what's the third thing we do? We accept the science first, second we create advocacy, an adv advocacy coalition, and third we advocate. On issues like acidification, ocean research, water quality, fishery stock, healthy fish stocks, estuaries that protect our marine habitats, seagrass that protect our shellfish. And yes, we take on the issue of what is the right balance between energy security and environmental and ocean protection. Together with Gwen Graham, from a Democrat from the Panhandle of Florida, we have just introduced legislation to further extend the termination date of the offshore oil drilling ban in the Eastern Gulf. That is one way we can responsibly approach the balance between energy security, protecting the environment, and protecting oceans. And as advocates, we also have to do two things. This notion in Washington we call non-defense discretionary spending. Basically, the discretionary spending we determine each year that is outside the Department of Defense is a dwindling pot. And we need to advocate from within that pot for greater investment in the causes regarding uh, oceans and marine sciences that we hold dear. Because those decisions get made every year. Congress can shift priorities between domestic accounts every single year. And so as we look for champions, we need to find champions that through the budget process each year understand the importance of investing in our oceans. Each of you are here today because you've already taken up the cause to champion these issues and to work with elected officials on these issues. We need more champions working on the Hill. Oceans are a nonpartisan issue. Absolutely not. You know, I've been in office for a little over a year and people have said, what's your first impression? What's your most noticeable impression? And I say it's this. If we would drop the R's and D's behind our names, so many solutions and answers are just within reach. Oceans is one of those issues. There is nothing controversial about oceans, and there is nothing that, that Congress cannot embrace 
about supporting investing in research to ensure we have uh, higher, higher water quality, uh, healthier oceans, and ultimately, as they impact our coastal communities and the economies and quality of life of individuals that live along coastal communities, are the beneficiaries of smart investment by the folks right up there on the hill. So we can do this together as champions for the oceans and as champions for all that is right about the beauty of this country and protecting it as we go forward. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. If I can ever be of help, please let me know. Thank you very much. Congressman, for those few minutes, you were as eloquent as, uh, as possible. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, thank you very much for your words. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Senator uh, Baldwin from Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin's first woman elected to serve in the U.S. Senate. Senator Baldwin serves on the U.S. Committee on, Senate on, Committee on Appropriations, the Health Committee, Health, Education, and Labor, and Pensions, Senate Budget Committee, and the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. And in between all of that, Senator Baldwin is a strong advocate for Wisconsin, Great Lakes, Great Lake conservation than, than we could have uh, anywhere else. And in particular, Senator Baldwin has been a particular advocate for establishing a new sanctuary in her state. And, um, and it's wonderful to have you as a champion on the Senate. Uh, her full bio is in the program. Without further ado, let me invite Senator Baldwin to the podium. Hey, thank you. Oh, good morning. I understand uh, we are the first folks addressing you after Ocean's Prom, something I just learned about, something that I hope to put on my calendar in a future year. But I, I hope you all had a wonderful evening yesterday. And uh, uh, t this morning's uh, panel topic, creating and sustaining destinations for tourism and recreation, is incredibly timely for my home state of Wisconsin. Because tourism, travel, and recreation around the Great Lakes helps drive our made-in Wisconsin economy. Tourism in our state is an $18.5 billion industry. And we have over 800 miles of Great Lakes coastline. Uh, Wisconsin businesses and local governments appropriately view this as an area of incredible growth and opportunity. You really need look no further than NOAA's, uh, Wisconsin's NOAA National Marine Sanctuary proposal to see how much excitement Wisconsinites have for protecting our maritime heritage and our natural resources while increasing Great Lakes tourism. Local communities along our Lake Michigan coastline quickly became engaged in organizing the sanctuary proposal that you just heard about. It would encompass 875 square miles, noted for its 34 known shipwrecks. These shipwrecks are popular dive sites, and nearby communities serve as destinations for tourists. And Mayor Tom Lada of Port Washington, one of our great leaders, will be uh, telling you a little bit more about this uh, shortly. However, while the Great Lakes uh, strengthen our economy and our quality of life, we all know they also face ongoing threats and very real risks. And the time to act to defend our greatest freshwater resources is right now. That's why I am proud to be a member of the Senate Great Lakes Task Force and a proud supporter of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. GLRI helps coastal communities clean up waterways and shorelines. It helps restore wildlife habitat and make the Great Lakes healthier for everyone who uses them. And restoring our Great Lakes will help restore and drive economic redevelopment in our towns and cities, such as Port Washington. Earlier this year, I was proud to introduce the Great Lakes Ecological and Economic Protection Act, known as GLEPA to most of you. I did this along with a bipartisan group of my Great Lakes colleagues. 
this would provide greater certainty uh, for efforts uh, to do this type of restoration work uh, going forward. Our nation's Great Lakes and oceans are remarkable resources. I don't have to tell anybody in this room uh, that. Um, but they have such incredible impact on our economy and our quality of life. So I want to thank you for your active role, for your advocacy, for coming together and continuing to pledge to work together to achieve our objectives. And I want to, again, appreciate the fact that you're gathered here for advocacy, for uh, organizing, and uh, making an impression on the members of the House and the Senate. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your conference. Okay, so if I can invite to the stage uh, our panel, uh, and uh, as, uh, as they get situated, let me introduce very briefly Lauren Wenzel. Uh, many of us in the room know Lauren, so she doesn't need much of an introduction other than to say she heads the Marine uh, Protected Area Center within the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And uh, in that capacity, she's been doing uh, coordination of Marine Protected Areas, uh, what they represent, uh, nationwide and globally, and, um, and it's been a personal pleasure to work with Lauren for all these years. And with that, the panel's yours. All right. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so it's June. It's World Oceans Month, and it's also the time that many of us start to think about going to the beach or going to the lake or getting out of town and, and enjoying the, the outdoors and especially along the coastal community. So this is a great time to be talking about tourism which is, of course, a huge industry and incredibly economically important. We have about 67 million international visitors to the U.S. every year, and there's a concerted effort being made to increase tourism in the U.S. And then, of course, domestic tourism is much larger than that. And, of course, in local communities is really where tourism and its uh, benefits and its challenges really is where the rubber meets the road. So we're really pleased to have two mayors with us today to discuss the challenges and opportunities associated with coastal tourism. Um, I think it's, it's a great place to really get into these issues. Um, before we introduce our two speakers, I just wanted to remind you all that you can submit questions. So you have your question forums. I hope you will um, get the conversation going. We really uh, want this to be a, a dialogue. And of course, those who are listening online can submit through Oceans Live or using the hashtag chow2015. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. We, um, immediately to my left in the center here is Mayor Craig Cates, who's the mayor of Key West, Florida, and is a fourth generation conk and a successful businessman who has become mayor and was mayor since 2009. Um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And then we also have uh, Mayor Tom Lotta uh, from the city of Port Washington, Wisconsin. And he has been mayor since 2012, was elected at the tender age of 36. Um, <laughs> And prior to that was the Director of Development and Stewardship for St. Monica School and Parish in Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin. And both of these gentlemen also have uh, some experience with the National Marine Sanctuaries Program. Uh, obviously, there's uh, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary in, uh, near Key West and, and the proposal to create uh, or to nominate a National Marine Sanctuary in Lake Michigan. So I'm sure we'll be talking about that as well. But just to get the conversation started, I thought it would be great if each of you could talk about um, what makes your community special? Why do people come there? And uh, what would you say is the, is the special qualities of the, of the place that you live that attracts tourists? So you want to start, Mayor Cates? Yeah, I'd love to. And again, thank you for having me here today. Uh, Key West is uh, what we like to call it, the Caribbean island that you can drive to. <laughs> uh, it, and that makes us very unique. Uh, back, uh, back in the early 1900s, uh, you had to get there by boat. It, we didn't have a railroad till 1912, so uh, we're very uh, a big part of our economy. Our our uh, attraction is our maritime history uh, in the water. So people, we got beautiful waters in Key West. We got excellent weather, uh, beautiful architecture, historic buildings. Because Key West was the first uh, 
uh, millionaire in the state of Florida was a Key West. It was the richest uh, city in the state of Florida at one point with wrecking. So it, we've been very uh, connected to our reefs, our waterways, and also that's one of the big attractions. And, and as a community, we understand that and want to preserve that. Mayor Milano? Well, thank you. Thank you all for having me. Thanks to everybody for being here. And it's hard to follow after the uh, Key West is a place that you can, it's the Caribbean island you can drive to. I can't tell you that that's Port Washington. I also can't tell you that people uh, volunteer to winter in Port Washington. They don't. We just live there. Uh, but, but in all sincerity, um, you know, it's a pleasure to be here and to share the stage to, today with uh, Mayor Cates and talk a little bit about our very two special places. And I think for us, you know, really what, what drives special and, and place and community in Port Washington is really the sense of investment and ownership with our place on, on the Great Lakes, on Lake Michigan. Um, so, you know, so much of the conversation, of course, and rightfully so, is, is about oceans. And, and obviously, they're a very special place. But, you know, I think from a standpoint of, of the freshwater system, and, you know, again, right here within the United States, so much of that being represented, uh, not just in Lake Michigan, but in the five Great Lakes. And to know that as the only port in Ozaki County and uh, to have so many different thriving aspects of really our economy tied intimately to recreation and tourism and to the environment, uh, it, it's just, it's a wonderful place and it's a wonderful opportunity. But with that comes inherent responsibility and the, and the need to steward, be good stewards. Um, one of my favorite quotes uh, over the course of my almost now four years as mayor um, comes actually from Dr. Val Klump, who uh, is the head of the Freshwater School of Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. We're really fortunate in our corridor in Port Washington to have some outstanding higher education institutions, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee being one of them. And Dr. Klump, from a standpoint of just being stewards of the Great Lakes, likes to talk about the fact that if you take all of the world's water and you put it into a two-liter bottle, the amount of fresh water in that bottle would be 12 drops. And the amount of water represented by the Great Lakes would be about three of those drops. So it's a profound responsibility. It makes us feel as if we're, we're very special and very unique, but we're charged with really being caretakers of that, and, and I think we do a pretty good job of it. Great, and I know we want to talk more about the, the water side of this, but we're going to start with talking about the tourism side, just to get a little more background. So I was wondering, Mayor Cates, if you could tell us a little bit about how you've worked with industry to promote tourism in Key West. Well, Key West has evolved into a tourist destination within about the last 30 years or so. We were, the military was a big part of our economy. They pulled out and uh, we had to reinvent ourselves basically. And so we started moving towards a tourist destination. Then we just tried to accent that our, our beauty of the water, our, our diving, our fishing, uh, when we're one of the premier fishing destinations. So as a community, as a government, we work with our businesses to try to keep the community safe, clean, and uh, a, a business environment that they can be successful. And then it's up to the citizens and the businesses to really do the work and attract the people. And have you been marketing Key West? We've marketed to the TDC, which is a tourist development council, which I'm a board member of that. And uh, we market the Keys and Key West a little bit different. Uh, we tried, but. The majority of our marketing is our environment, our water. Some are is just uh, like paddleboard in the, in the areas where there's not very many people. Others is like Key West with its culture, its history with the uh, the water, the the oceans, the navy, the you know, all those. So we market the whole Keys a little different, but the main part that we market is the ocean. Okay, and and uh, Mayor Malata. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you're trying to promote tourism? Yeah, I think, and, and if, let me just say too, I, I mean, today I feel so pleasured to, and humbled and honored to really be here, not just on behalf, really, in my mind, of Port Washington, but really our partner communities uh, who are involved in our regional National Marine Sanctuary nomination, and that's Sheboygan, Manitowoc, and Trivers as well, right up the coastline. And I, I know they would echo this thought in the sense that I think one of the things for us is really public access public access to really uh, all of the resources that come with our special place on Lake Michigan, a variety of activities, um, certainly fishing being a, a big part of that. We've got a, a very tremendous charter fishing presence for the Great Lakes, and, and obviously there's huge economic impact with that. But as the mayor said, it goes beyond that. It goes uh, to all sorts of different activities connected intimately into the water and, and the lakefront and beaches and things of that nature. But it's also, I think, really promoting your maritime history and culture. 
you know, that aspect of things in terms of just the special places that we have to offer to really connect future generations with our past and then celebrate what we have in terms of a special place going forward. And I think the other part on this, is, and we've talked about this, Mayor and I, in terms of just preparation and planning is the aspect of being able to do all those things and enjoy those activities in a safe fashion. Mm -hmm. um, so changing uh, global conditions and from a climate standpoint for us have meant some challenges locally in terms of enjoyment of those resources, especially with changing conditions along the lakefront. And it's important that people, when they do feel like they're looking for a tourist destination, that they can go and they can in enjoy those things, those activities with family, and they know that we as community are taking every step we possibly can to ensure it's a safe experience. So you brought up climate change, which one of our questioners also did. And I'm just wondering if you uh, do have any specific thoughts about plans that you think need to be put in place to adapt to the kinds of impacts you might see in your region due to climate change. Well, obviously in Key West, uh, some parts of the city is barely above sea level. So, mm -hmm. And our comprehensive plan that we just updated, we uh, have uh, recognized uh, climate change and sea level rise with uh, uh, three to seven inches by 2030 and uh, nine to 24 by 2060. So that being said, every project and every plan in the future will have to recognize that and uh, build the uh, buildings and whatever accordingly. So we have definitely recognized that because we know the impacts, we've seen the changes already uh, because we have streets so with the tide will come up with the high, extreme high tide, so it's very noticeable. So we recognize that and then uh, plan for the future. Mm -hmm. Are you doing any planning for uh, expected climate change impacts? Yeah, you know, I, I love the fact that we're able to have these conversations and sort of bring them to a frontline experience because, again, these are these conversations that are global, but yet the implications are oftentimes very local. And, you know, for us, um, certainly one of the things, again, we talked about was beaches and with this changing water levels within the Great Lakes, um, you know, cyclically over the history of the Great Lakes, you see this ebb and flow of water levels. But, and, and I would tell you right now, I'm certainly not a scientist, but I appreciated the congressman's remarks about embracing science because, you know, what's really so strikingly different over these last several years is that these ebbs and flows seem to be more dramatic mm -hmm. and they're more compact. So in Port Washington, over the course of the last three or four years, we've gone from one of the lowest water levels in the Great Lakes to now one of the highest in, in recent years. And with that means at one point in time, of course, ironically, a wide expanse of beach and a lot of activities and a different way of addressing waterfront safety. <laughs> and now a very narrow expanse of beach in certain areas. And, and of course that puts stressors on infrastructure in different ways too, especially for us over the winter months. And so we have to address how we plan forward and potentially procure funding to uh, stabilize some of those in pieces of infrastructure that really protect our city, including our breakwater. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing I would, I would say is from a standpoint of just the impact of invasive species. You know, it's ironic of course that I grew up in Sheboygan, uh, which again is just up the line from Port Washington along the coast. And uh, so spent 18 years of my life there and now I've lived in Port Washington for 16. So I've been pretty blessed to live along the lakefront community for much of my life. And the reality is for a period of time growing up when I would be on the lake with my dad, you couldn't see a foot down into the water. And now you can see 60 feet down into the water. So the presence of zebra and quagga and goby fish and Asian carp and things that really impact our ecosystem in terms of the Great Lakes you know, inherently it, it's intertwined and it's all interconnected, but you know, there's a tipping point for these things. And so we obviously have to prepare for those conversations too and how we potentially address those things. There's benefits, if you will, from a standpoint again of the dive industry and other economic activity, but there's real potential for, for danger in terms of some of these things as well. So always planning for it in terms of those conversations also. So I think a lot of times when we talk about marine protected areas, there's concern that that might constrain economic activity. And I'm curious what your impressions have been about the trade-offs between sustaining environmental protection and the, the desirability of these places as a place to visit with a, a healthy business climate. Well, we can work hand in hand with that. We've been a, a national marine sanctuary for over 20 years. And I know when it first came in, uh, people were very concerned about it and there was some pushback. But over the years, we've recognized the importance of it. We're also a state uh, area of critical concern, so we have a lot of overview of everything that Key West and the Keys does. But uh, as a community, we've come together and understand that is our attraction, that is our livelihood, so we must protect it. 
So we, the businesses recognize that, the government recognize that. We have uh, our, all the two marinas that the city owns are clean, uh, state certified clean marinas. We furnish pump out to, to every vessel in there and require it. If you want to come and visit Key West and anchor offshore to come into Key West with your dinghy, you have to prove that you have pump out service coming to your boat or you can't come to shore with your small boat. So we are as strict as we possibly can to require that people do uh, respect their environment. And then the businesses have got down to our uh, the ferry service down there. <clears throat> ferry uh, dive and snorkel trips and stuff, even down to uh, public uh, message of being Carl conservatives, uh, conserve our Carl, but also as little as their suntan lotion that is not invasive to the uh, uh, the waters, they furnish that for the, all the people that are snorkeling. So the businesses understand that, and we understand that's our future, so we, we help preserve it. So uh, I was a, an economics major with an environmental policy focus, and so I've always been really fascinated and driven by this intersect of these two areas. Um, and I, I appreciated the congressman's remarks, and I know we've heard this talked about in this forum about this being a, a bipartisan issue, you know, something we can all really get behind. And I think that's such an important message. Um, you know, too often I think we start from a place of either or when it comes to economic development or environmental stewardship or sustainability. And the reality is they're both intimately connected. In fact, they drive one another very intimately, as you alluded to in some of your examples there, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, so whether they're principles into and of themselves, um, I, you know, I think communities need to understand that they're a collective cause. And, and so businesses are a big part of that, but city and community residents as well, doing everything we can from a conservation standpoint, but also bracing, embracing the fact that, again, true innovation and economic growth can be driven by the need for environmental sustainability and, and for stewardship. Um, I also would I borrow a little bit, I guess, of Lombardi here. I think building this into the community ethos, it, it, it really is not about a sometimes thing. I mean, really and truly, I think we need to collectively embrace the fact that you don't just wake up and decide to do it sometimes. It, we, we always have to be about these, these issues and the conversations we're having. So whether it's conservation among residents of things that we can do or business opportunities, really inherently that's what the sanctuaries are about in my mind. You know, uh, Senator Baldwin referenced that, but just the ability to really have these uh, additional layers of protection, preservation, but still ensure that economic development can really grow and, and thrive and sustain with jobs locally and, and other opportunities. In Port Washington, we've got one business who's really become a regional and now growing into a national leader in energy efficiency, Franklin Energy, and, and that really spawned out of local uh, state of Wisconsin energy efficiency efforts. And now they work throughout the country with utilities and help them implement their energy efficiency planning. So, you know, that's one example. You all with, you know, again, the sanctuaries throughout the system. You have, I'm sure, plenty of examples where this is the case. Uh, Alpena, of course, with the very thriving glass bottom boat operation. But there is that synergy. We have to embrace that. And, and again, it has to be our collective cause. OK. Um and Mayor Malata, you've just mentioned you know, public engagement and, and working with the public and helping them understand the issues. We've had a couple questions come in about that subject. Uh, one relating to the last summer's uh, algae event in Lake Erie and the city of Toledo having to um, shut down their, their drinking water supply for a few days. And just wondering if you've seen um, changes in awareness and acceptance of environmental issues. And then related to that, uh, a question wondering if we can tap into tourists as citizen scientists and actually put them to work collecting data or being more engaged in environmental conservation. So I'll start with you, Mayor Malata. Certainly. So um, one of the first things that actually I, I did in April of 2012 upon being elected was uh, launched an environmental planning committee. Uh, sustainability and stewardship really are driving principles to engage people in these conversations because you're right, we haven't been afflicted, if you will, with some of these algal blooms and other things that uh, you saw in Lake Erie, fortunately. But to our north, up in the Bay of Green Bay, there's been significant issues. Um, and so again, to the point of what can we all do individually and collectively to potentially prepare and prevent those types of, situ of situations, I think anything we can do to really engage and empower, and really, again, this is what again, the, the uh, sanctuary system is all about in terms of engagement and empowering and, and really building communities around these principles. Um, so we, we've done that, we continue to do that in terms of just our collective causes, but it extends beyond the waterfront. You know, because again, 
some of the algal bloom situation is for Wisconsin is a derivative of, of farming. Mm -hmm. And so of course, you know, working to really ensure that not only are we treating water effectively, but that before it even gets to that point, before it potentially could have impact on our beaches, that we're having conversations and doing what we can to really partner back and forth with our farming community. So for example, one of the things that we're now looking to do in the city of Port Washington is we're actually launching a compost program and we're going to, we're working with local farmers so that instead of us taking a lot of that to landfill, it can go out to them. Instead of them making use of fertilizer that might be higher in phosphorus content and potentially wash off and get in the, the rivers and streams and eventually into Lake Michigan, this is much better for the land as well. So it can be a win-win, again, back to that synergy. You can start small and have people feel very good about that and build into that larger impact. So Mayor Cates, I know you have a lot of visitors coming to Key West. Are they getting an environmental message while they're there and getting engaged? Yes, I believe so. We have three million visitors on our little island of 25,000 residents. So that obviously it makes a huge impact on us. We actually have a sustainability committee that the mayor and commissioners appoint that uh, always keeps up to date, advises the commission on uh, the issues that we should address. And we've hired a sustainability coordinator to make sure we get the message out there. Uh, the, the importance of uh, protecting the environment. And just as like the mayor had said, Key, Key West is uh, going the extra mile. We've installed 140 uh, wells around town to take the stormwater runoff from the rains uh, with catch basins so it doesn't just dump into the sea around us. And those wells, will we clean out the catch basins and, and uh, to, to prevent that water from running off just in that day-to-day uh, rain, all that pollutes the air, the local waters, the near shore water. So there's many things that you can do and Key West, our, our sewage treatment plant is, uh, was uh, uh, updated to advanced wastewater treatment 10 years before we were required to do it. We've got two deep water injection wells. We've spent a lot of money over $60 million in our sewer systems down there to update it. So uh, there's a lot of things that communities can do, even though they have a lot of visitors that come to visit them, to lessen the impact of those visitors on the, on the environment. And I would just build up that too, Lauren, that some great points by the mayor, you know, and it kind of alluded to sort of that ground up mm -hmm. mentality. And again, I think it's so critical that we as communities really do engage at the lowest levels in terms of really formative educational experiences. And that can be, you know, again, ways small and large. Um, through things even such as our museums, where you bring them and give them a sense of, of history and place and community and just how special these areas are that we're charged with really being stewards. But you know, again, you, you referenced, Mayor, in terms of stormwater. I mean, get, get communities involved in terms of rain garden activities and, and things that really give kids an understanding of why would we do these things? What is the impact? How am I a player on the local and effectively then the global level as well? Great. So um, I know you're both aware that we had a session on Cuba yesterday. A lot of interest in that. So this is for both of you. I know you're both equally connected to Cuba. No, just <laughs> um, uh, there's one question about how efforts to normalize relations with Cuba will affect Key West tourism, and then another more specifically around ferry travel t to Cuba, and whether there will be, you know, what kinds of impacts on traffic and parking there might be. So any, any thoughts about uh, the impacts of tourism in Cuba on Key West? Well, I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> no, we're, we're only 90 miles from Cuba. We're closer to Cuba than Miami. Uh, I like to use the analogy, we're closer to Cuba than a Walmart in Key West. So it, it, uh, I, was just in Cuba. I was just in Cuba a few weeks ago for the first boat trip that was permitted to go over there. It was a sailboat race between Key West and Cuba, and we went over there, and our Hobie Cat racers challenged uh, some Cuban uh, sailors, and uh, we raced right in the front of there. So I think there's going to be a great connection there. Obviously, it'll affect uh, our, uh, our economy, I mean our tourists, in a way, in a positive way, Key West feels. It'll increase our marinas with boat traffic, which is important that we protect the uh, marinas and the waters around us as that increases and also we think people will take day trips and the ferry service is, uh, is what would take them over there for a day or a couple of days and bring them back. Now how many people can come through Key West for that? Uh, we don't know. I mean uh, we couldn't take a, a lot of cars to come down and park the cars and then go to Cuba on a ferry. That wouldn't work out for Key West because we're already pretty much uh, I don't say maxed out, but we're really close at certain times of year. We can't take anymore. So, yes, it's going to be a positive impact, we believe, 
but uh, it's going to be a little different uh, for, than what a lot of people think, I believe. So, uh, you know, Cuba is not a direct issue for Wisconsin, but I'm going to give some business cards <laughs> and some tourism literature to the mayor. And the next boat trip down, you let him know. We'd love to have him come north of Wisconsin. When they get tired of all that sunshine, <laughs> that's right. That's they right. Need a little you know, break. Yeah, absolutely. There's something there, about seasonality and all the good things we have to all offer. All that snow is to. very exotic. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Right. You know, um, in, in all sincerity, in sincerity, though, in, in terms of the impact to us, obviously, you know, I can't speak directly to that. But I would say I think it speaks to the fact that we as tourism destinations always need to be thinking about global uh, connectivity. And, you know, for me, for example, and I know I'm, I'm sure I speak on behalf of my uh, cohorts and my friends in Sheboygan and Manitowoc and Two Rivers, again, part of our, our regional nomination with the National Marine Sanctuary. Um, one of the questions I ask formatively in terms of these things is why the Great Lakes and why now? You know, so you can drive that even down further. Why Port Washington and why now? And you know, some of what I think we have to celebrate and hopefully bring in people from around the world is really just in terms of the underwater treasures that we have to offer and just the unique aspects of the system itself as a freshwater system. And really inherently one of the most critical freshwater systems in the world. Um, that people will be able to come and, from a tourism standpoint, really experience some incredible things that, you know, again, a little bit of a different experience from, from the ocean. Um, certainly the water's not quite as warm. But needless to say, I think that there are some things that you, you build an experience that are so unique and really give you an appreciation for maritime history in a different way. And, you know, as the, Congress, or as the, the senator alluded to, um, you know, within the boundaries potentially of our sanctuary, uh, we're talking about uh, 34 known shipwrecks, but up, up to perhaps 140 uh, shipwrecks, uh, ships that effectively were at one time gone missing. So you know there's going to be more discovery yet to come, and with the conditions in the Great Lakes today, it's such an opportunity to connect people and experience those things. So, and just water in general. One of my favorite quotes, and I'll, I'll borrow this from Ellen Brody, the Great Lakes uh, uh, coordinator for NOAA, um, but Ellen likes to talk about the importance of bringing the water and assets to people. Mm -hmm. And inherently, I think that in terms of our tourist destinations, our coastal communities, that's our job. Our job is to ensure access to those things so that generations to come understand just their importance in being caretakers, but again, the ability for them to really enjoy that as a life experience. So that kind of ties into a question that's come in, which is, these are both beautiful places on the water. People come to enjoy the, the lovely ambiance. How much do you think your visitors are connected to the issue of conservation and having a protected area there. And is that a, is that a significant asset in terms of attracting tourists and also uh, the, the life of the community? I'll start with you, Mary Cates. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, it, it, it has actually grown that more and more people come coming and they're doing uh, environmental tours, they're doing volunteerism, vacations to, to help clean up the uh, beaches and the mangroves and uh, we have turtles that they've uh, rehabilitated there in, in Marathon Turtle Hospital. They've come and help with the releases when we, uh, if there was, uh, sometimes there have been groundings uh, of the whales and different times uh, that they've come to help. So yes, the, I think the people are recognizing that. Uh, there's more and more flats fishing, different type of fishing, which is no take. Uh, they just catch the fish for the sport and release them. Uh, there's more uh, tours around that uh, with a minimal impact on the uh, environment. There's not just going and catching as many fish as you can uh, just to take home. So that, I think it's changing and there, people recognize the importance of preserving the environment and the, and the uh, tourists are, are adjusting that. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely, I, I would agree wholeheartedly. Um, you know, it's funny, again, I'll harken back to growing up in Sheboygan, my experience of being a kid up there and, and enjoying the lake and being so blessed to really call that place home too. Uh, my dad used to say, I'd hear him say it quite a bit to people when we would, would be out fishing, he would say, there's no dress rehearsals in how we care for our greatest assets. Mm. And I thought that's just such a great mentality of just, we don't get a second chance. And again, I think if we do this right, from a standpoint of this balance between environmental protectionism, environmental pr preservation of our most sensitive areas, really sustainability and stewardship, not just environmentally, but economically as well. I think if we do these things right, it really permeates every aspect of the community. So to the mayor's point, I mean, I think it's activities along the lakefront, like your beach cleaning, and we've got a program in place with our businesses for that. And, and it's an opportunity for your residents to come out and volunteer for Clean Up the City Day. And it's adopt a park, a garden park programs that we have in place. I really think it's just a higher level of commitment to say this is really critical and when you come and visit our, 
our place, you're going to have a very true sense of that. So, you know, one of the statistics I love about Port Washington is that for a relatively small city, we have 36 parks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a profound commitment to green space and silent sport activity and recreational living. And, you know, again, when we talk about development going forward, one of the developments we're working on right now, we have an area right along the bluff, and of course, of course bluff stability is a major concern uh, in throughout the Great Lakes and in Port Washington. And we have a, a develop, an area of development, and the initial propositions we were receiving were for high density. Mm -hmm. And as a city, we said, we don't want that. We don't, that's not the place for it right there. There needs to be public access, there needs to be preservation of those environmentally sensitive areas, and so now, the development idea that we're working on is actually a low density residential development with a winery component. So it's a vineyard, it's a commercial aspect. And we're just, we're static about it. Uh, it's a great balance. So I think if you have that sort of mentality throughout, again, it just permeates every aspect, land and water. So we have a couple of questions about public perceptions. And um, I'm wondering, particularly when you have visitors who aren't from coastal communities and maybe they don't understand the sensitivities of uh, a coral reef ecosystem or of fresh water and, and uh, um, the, the steps, the extra measures that are necessary to protect those places. Uh, what kinds of actions are you taking to really help people understand uh, the importance of these coastal places and, and the extra effort that might be needed to protect them? Well, uh, in Key West, our, our authority goes out from 300 to 600 feet around the city. Uh, out into the water, so that's where our authority is. But we're constantly put, getting the message out, and the businesses, and our our promotion with the TDC of the the importance of protecting the environment, the corals, how sensitive they are, protecting the the near shore, shore waters. So we're constantly preaching that, and I think the message is getting out, and the people to come there come for the beauty uh, of the water and the weather. And uh, they want that to continue also. So we're very blessed to have the terrorists to come for that reason. Obviously, they come, Key West has a reputation of, of uh, being a party town also. But we have our downtown area that is for the party and in the nightlife. And then we have our water activities that are very important. A lot of people come just for the water activities. It's, it can, it, we have a balance between family, destination, and uh, coming down to uh, celebrate. So that balance is, uh, is what we try to do in the community, which uh, with those, the tourists coming as many as they do, that gives us the opportunity to do more things for our locals and to be, have uh, more events uh, that benefit different uh, nonprofits uh, with the tourists that come. But we are continuing to push, uh, you know, preserving our environment, and I think that is what the, the whole message is lately. So one of the primary issues that drive invasive species within the Great Lakes admittedly is, is ballast discharge. Mm -hmm. And obviously we, we at, in Port Washington, we can't really affect that. We're, we're intimately connected to the Port of Milwaukee and of course the Port of Green Bay and other ports throughout Wisconsin where this does come into play. And unfortunately invasive species then once they enter, of course have impact throughout the Great Lakes ecosystem. But one of the things that we can message with folks as they move throughout all of our rivers and inland lakes is the importance of not transferring those invasive species. Um, so whether it's your Eurasian milfoil or things that have an impact from a vegetative perspective or again, whether it's a, an actual uh, um, fish species or something like the goby or the Asian carp, I mean, things that potentially would transfer uh, have impact locally as well, very much. We see this within our fisheries. So um, you know, we've seen that locally, again, growing up in Sheboygan, and going out smelting with, with my dad, you'd drop the net in the water and you'd have a full bucket in one drop. Nowadays, that doesn't happen. And lake perch, uh, you know, that, that species is, you know, we go out, you could catch lake perch by the dozen, and now it's a, a much a more difficult catch. So those things have been impacted by those invasive species. The other part on that, I think, again, and where there is connection to the water is what we do from the land perspective. Uh, and transfer, again, of, for example, in Wisconsin, emerald ash borer, of course, that's been impacted throughout the Midwest. Um, but We've really been trying to take steps locally too for people to understand you can make a difference. You know, to your point, Mr. Mayor, in, in terms of start here locally and then broaden out with your ripple effect the impact that you can have. Um, but we, we inherently, we have to embrace those challenges. We have to overcome them together. It's a collective cause. So we've been talking a lot about the, the economic benefits and also the environmental challenges of tourism. And I'm just wondering if you all have given thought to the issue of how much is enough tourism or where do you stop? 
and, and how much, and how do you set that limit and also uh, communicate that to people when you're trying to promote an area for tourism? Uh, do, you, do you say, we want you to come, but not all of you? So, uh, so can, you, can you speak to that, Mayor Cates? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've been uh, recognized that for probably the last eight or ten years that uh, we're getting it to a point where we can only hold so many visitors. We're a two-by-four mile island. We, only, we have about 6,000 hotel rooms. And uh, so that being said, what we're trying to do is raise the level of the services, the attractions, the activities which you can charge more for and uh, make more money with the less amount of people or the, the maximum amount of people that you have. Not just more and more and more discount rates to get uh, people to come to your community. We don't really have the discount rates. Uh, we've been able to keep the services at a high level and the, the, the facilities at a high level which the people will pay more. So that's why we're trying to address it. Not just more is better. Right. And, and for us, I think a challenge is a little bit unique in the sense that we're so seasonal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously about six, seven months of the year. I don't want to make Wisconsin sound like, you know, the, the winter wonderland to the north where you can't venture out in November, December, January, February. You, of course, can. But our part of our challenge, I think, is to ensure that we really balance that tourism out, that we're, from a sustainability standpoint of our business partners, mm -hmm. that we're doing what we can to attract people throughout year-round, not just in a very heavy, intensive tourist time of year. Um, but, you know, overall, from my standpoint, I think the things that we're doing now are really geared not so much at driving uh, tourist numbers, but really driving tourist experience. You know, again, giving them a, a sense of life on the Great Lakes and just how proud we are of our maritime history and culture. And, again, the connectivity to the sanctuary system and, of course, the importance of the freshwater system that is the Great Lakes. And, again, all these underwater treasures. And that extends, as I said, from Port Washington to the south all the way up through Sheboygan, Manitowoc, and two rivers to the north. Um, so our museum experiences are really meant to be hands-on, interactive. Um, Maritime Museum up in, in uh, Manitowoc, of course, a uh, home of, of shipbuilding industry in Wisconsin, and uh, a very proud submarine history in terms of, of World War I and II. And, and there they have uh, the USS Cobia uh, for people to experience. The ability for us to generationally, again, connect people and have them understand just exactly the things that drove the placement of those communities, why they sprung up there. Uh, and then to experience that going forward from a standpoint of come and, and understand it's a really special place. You two are a caretaker while here. Uh, I think we can continue to drive tourism spending. We're about one third of tourism spending in the state of Wisconsin along the I-43 corridor, so the areas that I mentioned. So I think we, we stand to really benefit from continued growth, but it's right growth. It's not necessarily driven by number but really driven by that experience, not just for the visitor, but for us as resident base. So you've both talked about the visitor experience, and this is a question that really kind of gets at the partnership with NOAA in that experience, uh, the Eco Discovery Center in Key West, and then, of course, as an example, the, um, the Visitor Center in Thunder Bay that may have uh, been an example to you as you thought about what, what a National Marine Sanctuary could bring to your community. What, what kind of role has that uh, center played in terms of engaging visitors, helping them understand the place, um, and, and also kind of inspiring more of a conservation ethic? Well, I'll speak to that. Uh, the, the eco center there in Key West has become a, a huge part of the community. We have a uh, celebration there every year. Uh, I forget the name of they call it, uh, uh, the festival, but it's a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And it brings awareness to the, the citizens of the importance of our of the environment, uh, Wyland would come and donate his time and, and uh, draw uh, drawings there and uh, auction them off and all the money would go to the eco center and the sanctuary to help uh, fund uh, different events. We had, uh, uh, they have a coral uh, uh, nursery out there where they're growing coral and they just planted a, uh, last week a 1,600 uh, small pieces of coral out on the reefs to help uh, replenish the coral reefs. So it's very important, the, the sanctuary and the involvement of the eco center in the community to get awareness out there of the importance of our preserving that. And the community gets very involved. There was several thousand people at the last event, and uh, it gets bigger and bigger every year. They, they expand out on the city property, and we had donated parts of the 
property that they could use to for their fundraiser and every year they ask for more so it's being uh, more and more successful great for us uh Alpena, Th the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, but Alpena uh, and everybody who has been intimately connected with that effort, it's been our model. I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, in terms of just the process that was followed, the engagement, as you said, Mr. Mayor, of community residents and stakeholders and investors, uh, really that ground up emphasis of everybody having ownership in the outcome. Um, and, and I think just the way that it's been implemented so that now it's part of, again, that community ethos. It's part of just the community fabric. It is truly the way by which they identify themselves. I had the pleasure of visiting that beautiful city in, uh, um, back in September of, of last year when they were celebrating the 10th anniversary and their expansion. Congratulations again to everybody in Alpena. And it's amazing to me the job they've done. they've done. It permeates, again, as we talked earlier, every aspect of that community. There is such a sense of palpable pride. And I think when you again, really generate that sense of ownership investment when you really leverage the support that is available through the sanctuary system and through staff who are, are so instrumental in ensuring that you, we are moving and advancing these efforts forward. Um, again, I think the regional component of it for us is something that's unique and something that we've really embraced. We've just been so excited about, but we've used the Alpina model. And again, everybody there who's really driven that forward, Jeff Gray and Ellen Brody, and again, Mayor Walagora and everybody who's been a part of that effort, we've really used that as our basis. And it's so interesting to me that here today we had Senator Baldwin, um, and of course our other senator from Wisconsin is Senator Ron Johnson. And, and admittedly, you, you probably would not have two senators from one state with more disparate political views. And yet the two of them were advocates for our National Marine Sanctuary nomination. They signed on as a letter of support. Congressman Petri at the time, now Congressman Grothman from Wisconsin, has done the same locally for us as his other congressional representation to the north. Um, and, and our governor, Governor Walker, was of course a big champion on this because we can't forget it's not just a, a regional and a local effort, but truly this is our state potential uh, national sanctuary. So, national marine sanctuary, so. Um, so. So I, I, you know, f I, I think our greatest source of pride is, is just the fact that our nomination reflects that um, and that level of support, 110 letters of support from throughout our communities. And again, that's really been based upon that model that was put into place so successfully in Alpena that continues to drive people to that community, to this visitor center, experiencing the Great Lakes and obviously all of its treasures. So here's a related question for you, Tom. Uh, if your nomination for a sanctuary were to move ahead to a designation, what level of economic growth due to tourism do you foresee? And do you have any, um, any analysis that you've done based on uh, experience of other sanctuaries or other protected areas? We, we have, um, from a collaborative standpoint, again, we've, we've been really fortunate that uh, from the get-go, our tourism uh, communities have been working together. So our tourism directors and our county uh, chambers of commerce uh, have really been looking at those numbers, and certainly Alpena provides a model for that. Uh, given our location right along, position right along the I-43 corridor, and the fact, the fact that already about a third of state visitor spending is captured there, uh, I, I think it's safe to say we, we do feel like there will be very sustainable and significant economic impact and tourism value to a sanctuary advancing forward. Um, so right now, I think within our three counties, we see about $3.3 billion in visitor spending and about 7,500 uh, 7, full-time equivalent jobs that are sustained by tourism and recreation. Certainly, we, we think that's going to grow significantly. And, and I think you know, the, the relevance to that isn't just the direct growth, the direct connectivity on it, but just what it will sort of spawn, again, that innovation and that sense of, I think, at all levels, including school district and education and, and research and exploration, just what you know it's going to bring. Uh, I think the resources that we really st will see come into the community and that the community themselves will really put forward are going to grow exponentially. So we've been talking about the opportunities and, and again about the challenges and I'm thinking you have an audience here of people from the federal agencies, uh, members of Congress have been here talking with us and their staffs. What kinds of tools and information do you need? Uh, we heard about resilience yesterday morning in terms of the coastal communities uh, experiencing climate change impacts, other sorts of uh, invasive species. What, what kinds of help are you looking for as local leaders to help you do a good job in managing your communities? You want me to start on that one? I can do that. Okay, go ahead. All right, good. <laughs> we're, we're, we're a good tag team now at this point. You know, I think one thing that jumps off the page, beyond the obvious, which is continued funding, obviously, for the sanctuary system. Um, 
I, I think for me and for us locally, and this does intimately connect, is the importance of really caretaking and investing in our infrastructure. And for us, of course, that, that's really harbor specific, but you know, it, it goes to all levels of, of infrastructure throughout the community. But you know, our reality is that we've got a huge charter fish, uh, fishing operation. We have a marina that is a multi-million dollar ec uh, economic impact to the city of Port Washington, has to our partners uh, in Sheboygan and Manitowoc and, and Two Rivers. But for us, infrastructure aging at the level that it is, um, locally it puts significant pressure on you. And you know, again, from a tourism-based economy, from a recreation-based economy, our reality is we can't do that alone. Um, we've been, we've had great partnership with the Corps of Engineers, uh, been very responsive, and we've had great support from our elected officials here serving in Washington, D.C. to help advance those efforts. And certainly we all understand, we all get the, the aspect of limited funding and of course the pressures of, of, our, of our debt, our about $20 trillion debt within this country. But I think that if we can switch the vernacular into understanding that infrastructure and again, oceans, water, lake, freshwater systems in general, sanctuary system, is about investment. I think we can get beyond the short term of it viewing as a cost and understand that there is a long-term stewardship here in terms of growing these resources for our communities. You need those systems in place though. There's just no doubt about it in terms of offering that layer of protection and that sense of confidence that these communities can really continue to invest in, in themselves, draw people to their waterfront resources and to coastal community living and that obviously they'll be able to, to enjoy that for years and years to come. If we don't sustain those things now, and I'm speaking specifically, for example, in Port Washington our, to our breakwater structures, and they fail, not only is the cost obviously inherently more, but there's impact to our community in so many different ways, not only our efforts in tourism and recreation, but of course our efforts in terms of the sanctuary system and other things. So that is something, and again, we've had great support. I understand that we're a small com smaller community and that you have a level of prioritization. But to your question, that is something that I think really needs to be forefront throughout the entire nation, not just even locally, just that importance of infrastructure and doing that right. Mayor Cates, what would be at the top of your list for a healthy coastal community that you, that you can help lead? Well, uh, it may seem kind of a simple, but uh, I believe that the, the uh, sanctuaries need to have a little bit more local decision making uh, for the areas they're in. Uh, what I'm uh, addressing here is uh, quality of life issues for the locals that live here that have used the waters, the islands in a certain way for many, many years with, uh, with really minimal impact on them. But when you multiply that thousands of times and you have millions of visitors, it, it is a cumulative impact on that. But then people lose their uh, lifestyle, their way of life, the, the reasons why they live there. So that being said, I was we hoping that there would be able to uh, law, uh, rules and laws that they could address that. I was talking to uh, Nancy Finley down in Key West uh, about one of the islands where it was created in Hurricane Wilma uh, from a sandbar and created an island. And it was protected because the birds uh, uh, land on it. Well, now the over the years, the island has uh, eroded away mm. because it's naturally gone. It was never naturally there. And, but it's still protected, but, and she was saying we really don't have uh, a, a way to go in there and open that back up yet. You know, so I think there's small things like that that would help the balance of uh, local residents with the tourist industry and make it a better uh, location or a better life for everyone. You raise an issue, Mayor Cates, just about the, the balance of, uh, of also uh, visitors versus locals and how you manage that, the, the coexistence of those two groups when maybe they're not uh, always interested in the same things. And you talked a little bit about the, the party crowd who goes downtown and the family group. Um, how, how have you managed some of those social impacts of tourism? Has that been a problem or do you feel like you've got the tools to, um, to keep those to a minimum? I think we have the tools to do that. Uh, just like there's boats that want to come down there, uh, uh, poker run that wants to go to one of the islands that is in the, the sanctuary and just had, throw a big party on it. Well, uh, the TDC and, uh, and the city of Key West, uh, we're against that. We don't want to allow that. And we stepped up uh, even before the sanctuary has had to get involved with talk with them because that's not the type of uh, usage that we want. Mm -hmm. And we know that'll be a negative impact on the islands. Although, yes, they bring thousands of dollars to the community, but you have to look at the overall picture 
of protecting the environment and the type of tourists you want. And that's what, uh, there's a fine balance there, but I think uh, we understand that and work closely with the sanctuary to uh, uh, make sure that we give them help to enforce their rules and they help us with uh, the locals and the quality of life that we would like to have. Yeah, and I would agree. I, mean, I think we have the resources, and I think I'll harken back to what I said earlier, and, and the mayor touched on this. I'm glad he did. But I think in balancing that out, again, our driver isn't necessarily numbers, but it's really about the right experience. Mm -hmm. The things that really showcase your community, that really identify with your brand, if you will, uh, and about who we are as a special community in place. I think inherently you want your festivals, obviously, to connect in that and celebrate. For us in Port Washington, they do. We have Fish Day, which is the world's largest one day outdoor fish fry coming up in July. Good warm time of year, so you can come on up and enjoy that if you want. Um, but we, we have a, a Maritime Heritage Festival that celebrates our heritage. And now this year, we're actually entering into a partnership with uh, Discovery World Science and Technology Center in uh, the city of Milwaukee. They have a tall ship, uh, the Dennis Sullivan, the state, the uh, tall ship of the state of Wisconsin. And we're uh, bringing her into the port of, uh, to Port Washington for three, potentially four weekends to bring, again, I think borrowing Ellen Brody's words here, bringing the, the water and the assets to the people mm -hmm. and giving them a, a sense of that history and that pride <laughs> in our culture and what we all collectively share, whether you're a resident, you live there, or, or you're just a visitor. And I know Sheboygan and Manitowoc and Two Rivers would say the same in terms of their experiences. So Sheboygan is, is uh, one of only four uh, uh, Olympic training centers for sailing and, and the only one in fresh water in the country. And so they're proud of that and obviously, rightfully so, certainly try to bring in from an experiential standpoint for residents and visitors sailing experiences in that regard. And uh, I know a, a great location in terms of surfing, so if that's your thing, uh, some great freshwater surfing in, in the city of Sheboygan, Manitowoc with the Maritime Museum, as I alluded earlier, all their programming really driven. So, you know, I think we can bring people in and know that we do have the resources we need, but also that we can really ensure that not only do residents feel like it's a right experience, it's showcasing us in the right way, but that visitors are gonna take that experience and export our brand with the right type of mentality in terms of what their experience has been as well. So Mayor Cates, Key West has been a tourism destination for quite a long time. You've grown over the years, you have a lot of experience. What advice would you give Mayor Malata as he is at the beginning of this tourism journey? What would you, uh, what would you tell him in terms of what you've learned? Well, uh, I think uh, he, he touched on it earlier about just more tourists. That's not the answer, but obviously you have to grow your tourist uh, destination for a while, but you've got to understand the balance between quality of life of the residents because that's what we have. We sacrifice down there to a certain extent, losing our lifestyle, our quality of life because there's so many tourists. So we just like the other day, uh, you're, you, one day you'll wake up and you'll see your residents are not supportive of increasing, increasing. We had we took the referendum last year, uh, channel wide, and just a study to to widen the channel to bring in larger cruise ships in the town. <clears throat> Voted against it, 73 percent. Did not even want to do a study. Did not want to increase. So, they, you know, when it starts to affect their livelihood, but some businesses want to save more. We make more money, and obviously, there's business people that want that but you got to think about the residents in their, in their life. And all this, although this invitation hasn't been extended, I would be presumptuous and say that I would be delighted to come down and spend some time with you in Key West. <laughs> okay. And perhaps, you know, we can, we can yeah. take a, a little bit of a walk around the city and enjoy some time down there in your nice weather. Uh, no, love, but but uh, likewise, we'd love you to come up to Port Washington. And, you know, I, I would say that, you know, just I, great points. I mean, certainly you're always striking that balance, no doubt. Um, and it's something that I think has to be foremost in our minds, not again, just as only as elected officials, but every aspect of our community. Well, and again, Tom, you are anticipating the last question, which is that on June 27th, 28th is Get Into Your Sanctuary Day. And uh, sites across the system are going to be celebrating the ways that people can get into their sanctuaries. And so we want to hear from both of you. What is your favorite way to get into your sanctuary or your, your would-be sanctuary in your case? Well, so, I, you know, for me, um, I'm, I may, I'll use air quotes here, and I know some of those who know me in this room will laugh, but I'm a runner. Uh, so I, I love the fact that in a small, intimate community like Port Washington, when you come into our marina, you're in the heart of our city. You literally can get off your boat and you can walk throughout the community. It also means for slow runners like me, I can leave my house and I can be running along the lakefront in six miles of public access in about 10 minutes' time. And I assure you that um, that distance is, is not 10 minutes. So, um, 
you know, I think for me, any time that I can really get out into along the lakefront, and we've got three girls, I know the mayor and I share that experience, and uh, you know, I, I, we're going to be, I'm sure, having a drink and, and reminiscing about how to get through three girls as well. I'm sure you can. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Uh, love them dearly. But, you know, any time that I can get them to the lake, experiencing the water and, and swimming and fishing and just all the recreational opportunities. I love going down within Port Washington and on some of those public access areas, just sort of stepping back and taking a look at all the different ways that people do embrace recreational living in, in coastal communities because it's unique for everybody. So at any one point in time, you might see kite flying, you might see picnicking, you might see fishing, you might, might see bodyboarding. You might, it, it's incredible to me the different things that our living on, on coastal communities affords us. But again, with that, those special responsibilities. So anytime that I can be down there with family and, and taking a look around at the connectivity too to some of those treasures that are out there in the lake, uh, again, our dive community has such great opportunities. And I know the sanctuary would really bring those things from the water to the shoreline for those of us who, like myself right now, don't have the pleasure of diving. We and my family and I, our girls, we would have an opportunity to really connect with that. So I look forward to that in Junes to come. Um, but for right now, I know there's an awful lot we can do already in the ways we connect people to the lakes. Great. And what's your favorite way to get into your sanctuary? Being on the water. Uh, my, I've grown up on the water down in Key West. My, kid, my daughters grew up on the water. My grandkids are on the water now. Uh, I, down there, you could go diving uh, in six feet of water and get lobster. All right. You, the kids can do that, uh, catch them with a net. When lobster season opens, uh, there's just beautiful islands to go out. So we're Every opportunity we're on the water, whether it's in a bigger boat uh, staying out for the weekend or smaller boat just going out for the day, the families get together out there, the residents, and, and uh, it's, I know it's warm, it's the middle of the summer, it's hot, but it's not, no more refreshing than getting the water up to your neck, sitting there cool and talking with your friends and all. There's no way to, better way to relax than being out in the ocean. That's great. Well, um, for all of you, June 27th and 28th, get into your sanctuary day. We hope you'll all be out enjoying your local sanctuary, or if you can't get there, to a local park near you. And I'd like to join you, uh, join me in thanking our speakers. And uh, I'd like to thank our moderator, Lauren Wenzel. Uh, let me. So this was a terrific discussion. Uh, two towns, two communities along the coast, one in the Great Lakes, one in, uh, in the Keys, one, one of the country's most popular destinations currently today, one, one of the most popular destinations of the future. <laughs> Current sanctuary, former sanctuary, no coincidence that those destinations will be National Marine Sanctuaries. One reason why these gentlemen are so eloquent is because they have the help of really wonderful partners. And again, thinking in the present and thinking in the future. Um, Mary Cates works with Sean Morton, superintendent of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, we look at sanctuaries that exist today as model homes. When we go buy a home, we want to know what it's like. We want to kick the tires of what's there. We walk into what's currently built as a model home. So we've got Florida Keys pretty well set. But for Port Washington and Wisconsin, the model home in the region is Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Bill Doros said last year here at Chow on record that that was his favorite sanctuary for all that Thunder Bay represents. <laughs> and, we have, and we have Jeff Gray, the superintendent of that sanctuary here with us, working with Tom, working with the region. It's really been terrific. The regional directors of both of those, we've got Reed Boney for uh, the Northeast region. And we've got Billy Causey for uh, the Southeast region, and of course, Bill Duros from the West Coast. Alan Tom's been running around, the fourth regional director for the Pacific region. And uh, it's really a great, a great team effort. So thanks to everybody. Uh, two housekeeping notes uh, as we break for, uh, for the next session. We've got a bookstore. Please feel free to uh, browse. Uh, we've got books from Brian Scarry, our MC last night. Jim Toomey note cards, uh, our MC from a couple of years, a lot of other wonderful merchandise for sale. Uh, and then uh, for lunch, we will have a special networking lunch for the Women's 
Aquatic Network, celebrating its 30th year this year. Really, they've been a fixture in town. They do phenomenal work, and uh, they've been having networking sessions for a long, long time. We're thrilled to have them part of Chow this year. Go pick up your lunch tickets if you don't have them already, and join Juan for its networking lounge, its networking uh, session in the networking lounge. So with that, thanks. We'll see you in half an hour.